I can talk a bit so you can test it before we actually start. How does it work for the recording? We have to interrupt the stream so it starts a new video or yeah. Maybe you can Yeah. Want me to keep I need to restart the recording. Sure, yeah, you just start it and let's see if it helps. Still the same issue. Still the same issue. Oh no, I'm not actually opening it. <laughs> For the people watching the stream, if you have any issues, just join the Slack channel that we've set up for the meeting and report any problems there. Now it should be fine? Okay. So if we're good to start, let me know. Yeah, good to go? All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to see a big group of people uh, willing to make the trip again. This time to Leuven la Neuve um, for the Easy Build user, meet user meeting. More people will be coming tomorrow as well, and some people will be leaving a bit early, so there will be a bit of moving around. Um, but there will be about 40 people attending the meeting, which is roughly the same as last year, so I'm very happy with that. Um, for the rest of the morning, I'll give an overview of. Um, of what we've been up to with EasyBuild the last year or so, I'll give an, I'll discuss the results from the survey we did, and then also give a bit of an outlook to what is coming in the coming year. Um, the slides are here on this link. I also upload, uploaded them to the event page, so you see a small <coughs> attachment sign there. You can get them there as well. So very briefly, um, the HPC Ugen team I work at at Ghent University. Um, so we're part of the central IT department at Ghent University, so we cater to the whole university, not to a specific group of users or a specific domain. We provide the hardware, we do training, we provide support, so the whole package basically for everybody at university, also companies and research institutes connected to the university, um, and even throughout all of Flanders, so not only to Ghent. So we have the, the equivalent of SESI, here in Wallonia, we have the Flemish Supercomputing Center in, in Flanders. And it may seem a bit weird to people that why do you have two centers in a small country like Belgium. Uh, th the answer is basically where the financing comes from. So this is the Flemish government pays for um, our infrastructure, the Wallonian government pays for the Wallonian infrastructure, so we have two separate centers, which is nuts in a country this small, but it's politics. Um, and EasyBuild was created at HPC Ghent now almost 10 years ago um, and we are still doing the lead development and let's say the um, yeah just keeping it going <coughs> who am I um, so I joined our team in October 2010 and just a couple of months after I joined EasyBuild was thrown into my lap or what has become EasyBuild I should say because it was nowhere near what it is now it was let's say, a, a, big, a bit of a mess, a big pile of code that was doing something, and it took me a while to actually figure out what it was doing, let alone how it, how it was doing it. Uh, we cleaned it up over the years, and it certainly got a lot better after a couple of years. And then slowly, I became the lead developer because Stain, who, who created it originally, didn't have time for it anymore. And then this community exploded around it, and I had to do this community management, release manage management as well. Um, like a whole bunch of things, including beer, and you'll notice this through the coming days, and certainly at Fosdem as well. Um, I like stickers. I have a big box of stickers. If people have stickers to exchange, I'm happy. I already have a spec sticker, and I need another spec sticker. <laughs> um, there's a lots of things I don't like as well, and most of them are connected to EasyBuild somehow, and some of these will pop up through the talk as well. Um, last year at Fosdem, I did this funny talk how to make packaging package managers cry this was done after seven years of fighting scientific software and i wanted to give a message like we most people are doing this very wrong and yeah people connected to it so the the, the room exploded when the talk was was going and uh, like 10,000 people have watched it on youtube so some people seem to agree with with what i was saying so that was that was cool um, so for, th for the meeting this week, in the end, we have 39 people attending. There's 41 on the list, but one is remote and somebody cancelled. So we have 39 in the end, 10 different countries, same as last year. 
a couple of companies as well. Um, some of them are already here, others are coming. Um, lots of local people, no surprise, so about 10 people from the, the SESI. We have another three people from the Flemish center. Um, and then throughout all of Europe, we have two people who flew in from the US. I don't know if they're here yet. Maybe they're still a bit jet lagged, um, but they will be coming. And also one brave person from the far non-European country, that's the UK. Um, so this is pretty similar to what we had last year in, in the Netherlands. So hopefully we can continue this, to have this broad community attending the meeting. The agenda, um, so I'll be talking most of the morning. This afternoon we'll have site presentations, <coughs> so sites showing how they are using Easy Build. And in the late afternoon we'll have the, again, me talking, showing a, a tutorial on creating Easy Config files and how to contribute them back. And then we'll try to play around with this a bit hands-on for those who want to. And there's also the brewery visit. Um, so some people will miss, if you attend the first brewery visit, you will miss the tutorial. Um, so maybe you can still change your mind about when to attend the brewery visit, but that's up to you. Mo some people here already know about the contribution procedure. So and Then tomorrow we'll have quite a lot of talks actually. So we, we try to do 50-50 hands-on and talks and throughout the meeting. It's a, sometimes a bit unbalanced, but I think it mostly worked out this time. Um, Grigory, who is not here yet, will, will talk about his collective knowledge framework. Adrian will talk about OpenHPC. Victor will talk about Reframe. Then we'll have mostly hands-on session, but with one remote talk in between from Jan in Spain, who's not uh, able to join us physically, but who wanted to give a talk as well. And then Eduardo, who flew in from the US, will talk about singularity in the afternoon. And we have three more remote talks back to back. Um, so we, we try to uh, plan these back to back just for practical purposes. And then a, a bit more hands-on maybe if there's time. Um, and there's also the tour of the data center, so for people who want to, and then we'll have the group dinner that is sponsored by HPC again. So thank you very much to, to Ewald for covering this. And then on Friday, we have a couple more talks. Xavier will be talking about his modules tool. We have a, a talk by Olivier, one of the local guys, about this Ansible module. Alan will be giving some thoughts on how we can score some funding in the uh, Euro HPC project for EasyBuild. And then Massimiliano uh, will be talking about SPAC, so giving updates on what SPAC has been up to the last year or so. Um, and then more hands-on. So we have less talks on Friday, more time for hands-on. Or people that want to or have to leave early uh, certainly can. At the end of Friday, um, a large part of the people here will be moving to Brussels to attend the FOSDEM meeting as well. So you're, you're certainly welcome to join us. Um, all the talks here will be live streamed and recorded. So we actually started the YouTube channel like last week to collect everything. Um, all the talks from previous meetings were also recorded. So we have everything recorded. That's very nice to have a historical record of that. Um, and they have, yeah, these are listed in, linked through playlists uh, in the channel. And also any talk I could find on EasyBuild, I also linked there. So uh, if something interesting pops up, you can certainly look at it again later. Then to the survey. Um, this is the second time we did a user survey. It was an idea that, that popped up last year. So last year we did it the first time, this year we did it again. Um, I feel it's a pretty good way to get a better insight into the community, <coughs> so what people like, what people don't like, how they are using EasyBuild, um, and so on. So we sent out a bunch of invitations through the known channels. It was a reasonably short survey, about 10 minutes to fill it out. We got close to 100 people responding, so that's more than last year, that's very good. Um, and at least in my, in my idea, it gives a fairly relevant view, but there are a couple of weird things that pop up in the survey that are not, cannot be correct, so to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, and I'll go through the, all the results here in, in between other things. Uh, EasyBuild community, this is a picture from last meeting in, in the Netherlands. Um, has really exploded beyond what we ever expected. So we originally <laughs> um, made EasyBuild available with the idea to get some feedback on it from people who were having another tool or had a better way of dealing with software installations. And after 
let's say in a year or two, we found out that we really uh, broke some new ground. So we had a tool that was helping out a lot of people, and lots of people started picking up on it, and the community grew around it. So that's that's very nice. And we try to be very welcoming and supportive to new people. So people that do not know EasyBuild at all yet can easily find help on the mailing list on the Slack channel or in meetings like this. Um, so you don't have to be an EasyBuild expert, certainly, to attend the meeting or to, to start asking questions. In the survey, um, a whole bunch of things were asked. So one, the first question was, what's your primary profile? So what kind of role do you consider yourself to have? Um, lots of people consider themselves to be system administrators or user support. So there's a clear bias towards that in the EasyBuild community. I think if you would ask the same question in the SPAC community, it would look very different. I, I would assume that there's more software developers, like only 6% here consider them to be software developers. Yeah, so I would think if SPAC ever does a survey like this, maybe this would be a good question to ask just to see how different the communities are. Um, what type of organization do people work for? This is pretty much all across the board. Um, and it's very similar to what we saw last year. So not the community hasn't shifted uh, significantly <coughs> in the last year. Lots of people from Europe. No surprise, I guess, because EasyBuild grew in Europe. About 20% in North America and then a couple more across the world. Uh, we saw a drop here in North America and a, a bit of an increase in Europe, I think this is due to SPAC. Because SPAC is very big in the ECP project, I think more American labs started using SPAC or switched away from EasyBuild to SPAC. And I think this is reflected here. Who knows, right? Th this is just my interpretation. I think SPAC is basically they will deploy to the existing connected protocol. Yeah. For that, it's better to have a start for the final deploy. Yeah, yeah. I know it's very much relevant in the, in the ECP project. So. I guess that may be why we're seeing this shift. I'm just guessing. Maybe North Americans didn't feel like completing the survey. That's also possible. Um, how long have people been using EasyBuild? So lots of people have been using it for at least two years. And there's a, a bit less um, new people, let's say, coming in. But that may also be because people that have been using it keep using it and are more keen to fill in the survey. I'm not sure. For the people not very familiar with EasyBuild yet, I'm, I'm not going to really introduce EasyBuild here. Kind of assume you know it already. Um, but one one important thing to uh, remember is that it's not the replacement for standard tools like CMake or Make or anything. It basically wraps around it. So it, it implements the whole installation procedure for you. So you can basically push the button and it does whatever it has to do to install the software. So we're not trying to replace CMake or anything, even though maybe it should be replaced. Um, it also doesn't replace YAM or apt-get, so the OS package managers, you will still need this. Um, but maybe it helps you to minimize the packages that you have to install in the OS through this. And EasyBuild allows you to install them in an optimized way for the hardware you are running the software on, and so on. And it's also not magic. I mean, you will still run into compilation problems Installations will still fail, um, but hopefully less so than you were doing it without EasyBuild. So if people run into problems there and figure out what magic compiler flag to use to fix the issue, it's hopefully already in EasyBuild and you don't have to even worry about it anymore. The way I see EasyBuild is it, it, it's a uniform interface to installing software. So no matter whether it's a Python package or something that uses CMake or something messy like OpenFoam, you just talk to EasyBuild and EasyBuild knows what to do. Uh, and that way it can save you a lot of time. You don't have to figure out the problems or the installation procedure. And it automates things like generating module files and, and all of this checking on itself to make sure the compilation actually worked and produced the binaries. And all these things you don't have to do, EasyBuild does it for you. Um, it helps to provide a consistent software stack to your users. So, because no matter who uses EasyBuild, it always does the same thing in the same way, according to how it was configured. So that really helps. And because lots of people contribute to it, it, it has really become an expert system for scientific software installation. People have fixed problems. People have optimized things, use the right flags for the right packages. Um, so it runs well, and it hopefully does what it's supposed to do once it's installed. <coughs> People are collaborating on it, so that's very nice. We, we never expected this to happen, but it did. And it even allows 
um, the scientists, the users of the software to manage the software stack themselves if they want to. And we actually see that more and more in Ghent, especially our biggest group, which is also quantum, a quantum chemistry group, basically doesn't come, us, come to us anymore to install software. They use EasyBuild to install their own software because it has become that easy. Just change versions, change compiler or configure options, and it just installs in their shared directory for their group, and they are happy. So we get less work, and they are happy. It's perfect. And back to the survey, what was the main aspect that, start, that made you use EasyBuild? Most people just say this, the central functionality in the EasyBuild framework. So the whole automation of the installations, generating module files, and giving you all the control you need to make EasyBuild do what you want to do. That's certainly the biggest factor. And then the next one is supported software. And that's very similar to what we saw in the last survey. How did you learn about EasyBuild? Pretty similar to last year, it's still word of mouth. So people telling other <coughs> people or giving a talk, like you should look into EasyBuild, try it. It's really going to help you. Um, so we shouldn't spend thousands of euros on marketing. Doesn't, it may not convince people. You just hand out stickers and let people talk about it. That seems to be the best way. So today we have um, EasyBuild has been stable for over six years now. So it started, as I already mentioned, in summer of 2009 um, in HPC Ghent. After a couple of years and after a couple of summer interns who cleaned up the code base quite a bit, basically turned it upside down, which is not something we had time for. Uh, but they basically redesigned it from the ground up and put the puzzle pieces back together. And at the end of their internship, we had something better, better organized. One of the interns actually told us, like, you don't have any <coughs> tests at all for this. It was back in 2011. Why not? And we said, ah, we don't feel we need it. So he started adding tests to it. And then, yeah, we basically did it for everything, every change we made. We made sure there was a test covering it, every bug fix, which has really helped with keeping it very stable. Um, at Supercomputing 2012, we did the first stable release, like literally the evening before we gave a talk on it. Um, and that seems to have worked out quite well. Some people started picking up uh, on it after Supercomputing and so on. So the community, it says here, emerged, but it, it really exploded around it over the years. And we've been doing frequent stable releases since then, as the timeline here shows. Um, and the development has really become community driven. So people contribute stuff, people report bugs that we are not aware of or that we're not hitting ourselves because we use it in a different configuration. And that's what drives the contribution <coughs> or the development rather. Um, most people are using the latest release, like the vast majority is using the latest release. That's very good. That means the effort mostly I do uh, or the effort we do as the community to push out stable releases is really is really useful. So either they're using the latest release or a, let's say a recent 3.x release. That's the vast majority. There's one or two people still stuck at EasyBuild 2. I'm not sure why, because the changes between 2 and 3 were not that big at all. So they should definitely look into making the jump to 3, and it shouldn't be much of a pain to to change it. And some people are very brave and are using our develop branch. That includes myself and probably most of the maintainers um, who know that develop is OK if you know what you're doing. You just don't do this in production, like I do. Um, and it's quite similar to what we saw last year. And people who are not using the latest release, so that's the, the color part here. Yeah, some people just haven't looked into it because of, of time or they're happy with whatever they're using now. That's OK. A minority of people ran into problems. Like there was an issue with the latest releases with in combination with GC3Pi because of a bug in GC3Pi, not because of a bug in EasyBuild. So it prevented people from updating. So that this does happen. And we try to, if, the, if these issues are reported, we try to yeah, fix them as soon as possible. Uh, the frequency of releases seems to be very good now. This is actually a, a bit better than the previous survey. So it was 65%, now it's 81%. I'm very happy with this because every release takes at least, I would say, a day, a day and a half of my time to run all the tests, check on the tests, and just puzzle the release together. 
I've been getting a big amount of help from Miguel, who's down in Singapore, <coughs> putting the release notes together. And it, it, it's not a lot of work, but it's it's fiddly and it's collecting from several places, and that that has been really useful. So maybe watching this the stream. So thanks a lot, Miguel, for helping out with that. This is an interesting one. It's it's a new question. I don't think we asked this last year. So on which operating systems are people using EasyBuild? most commonly so they could answer they could give multiple answers so we can't sum these or do a pie chart we have to do a bar chart like this but 70% of the people are using it, using it on CentOS 7 so it's maybe not a surprise it's the most common OS in the HPC community um, most of us know that there's all the green ones are the Red Hat based uh, distribution some uh, quite a lot of people are still stuck on CentOS 6 for maybe for their older systems. Um, that's important because CentOS 6 is, has Python 2.6 in the OS, so it's a bit of a, of an issue. Now it's it's not impossible to get Python 2.7 running there, but it's an effort that people have to make. So it's good to know that people are still stuck, and hopefully that's that's declining. Um, that will come back when we look at the Python versions. These are more exotic. OS's maybe some people are a bigger fan of Ubuntu or Debian or even SUSE, and then the gray people that's a whole different yeah, whole different stack. Yeah. That's going to be an interesting chart. How do you? It's four dimensional or yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, yeah, this only gives it, this may be one box, right? So it's hard to tell, but. Uh, and actually, um, I expect this has gone. If we would have asked this question last year, hopefully this one may have may have been a bit bigger. But hopefully, it's going down quite fast. Um, yeah. So 20% sent to a six, 10% rel six. So these people are kind of stuck to Python 2.6, which is not entirely true, but it's certainly a factor. And then here the Python version. So most people are using Python 2.7. No surprise. Some people are using Python 2.6, so that's CentOS 6 and RHEL 6 probably. Now, 10% of the people say they're using EasyBuild on top of Python 3. I want to talk to these people because EasyBuild doesn't work on Python 2.3, uh, Python 3 yet. Um, so this is one of the strange results in the survey. It's actually we saw this last year as well. So maybe the question is not clear enough, or I'm not sure. Um, it's just a funny result. But the good news here is the people using Python 2.6 is going down. And that's certainly good, so it's becoming less of a problem. How much of a problem would it be if we drop support for Python 2.6? So this is also going down. Most people st stopped caring, or certainly never. Nobody said disastrous, so there's certainly a way around it. Install Python 2.7, maintain it yourself, that installation, and you can certainly keep going. Um, so we can certainly consider dropping Python 2.6 support if it gives us some some kind of benefit. And I'll get back to that later. And then the, the elephant in the room, maybe a little bit. Um, running EasyBuild on Python 3 is certainly becoming more important. Um, Python 2 is end of life, end of this year. So it <coughs> will not get any security updates or anything anymore. It hasn't been getting new features for years already. Um, so we should certainly start looking into that. More people are starting to worry about Python 3, even though it's still not a critical problem in, in my view, because even the, the next RHEL version will still have Python 2. So apparently Red Hat is, is not able or not willing to drop Python 2 in, in RHEL 8. So they will certainly be maintaining it themselves and probably backporting fixes when, if they can. Um, so it's not going to disappear, but it's becoming a problem. And we've been aware of this for, for a long time, which is why. Um, for the next major release of EasyBuild, EasyBuild 4, and there's a tracker issue for this open, um, the, the main goal is to make sure that EasyBuild can run on top of Python 3. So we're done waiting or we're done postponing this. There's no point. Um, so we'll try to be compatible with Python 3. We'll definitely keep Python 2.7 support so that that will be there for quite a while. And maybe up until what I've seen now, even keeping Python 2.6 support is not going to be much of a hassle. So it, it's certainly possible to have something that's compatible with 
by 2.6, 2.7, and 3, and which is also what SPAC does, I think. Or something else. Yeah. Yeah. So even sp SPAC is already compatible with Python 3, but it's still compatible with Python 2.6. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it has the whole range. So it's certainly doable. And you don't even have to jump through a lot of hoops to to make it work. And the downside is you cannot use any of the fancy features of Python 3 because they're not supported in Python 2. That's the only downside, but I don't see that a huge problem. And it's certainly not, not the motivation to go Python 3 only. That would be too much of a of a push, I feel. Another thing I would like to do is get rid of dependencies for the easy build framework. So the easy build framework should be, or actually easy build as a whole, so two and three combined here, should be a single tarball that you can easily install with pip or whatever, and it shouldn't need any external things like DC base or VC install or even setup tools, because these, having these as dependencies has been too much of a pain. People run into installation problems. They can't install easy build to install other software with, and it has been a, a running joke in the community, and I'm, I'm fed up with it. So. Uh, that's something I, I intend to fix for Easy Build 4. It's already done. I'll, I'll get to the next slide on that. But for VC install and VC base, it's very easy to fix. It's already done, actually. Set of tools is a bit more difficult because some features that Easy Build has rely on having set of tools there to, like the include Easy Blocks stuff, now relies on having set of tools. But there are other ways of doing that. So hopefully we can figure those out and get rid of the set of tools requirement as well. Single tarball releases is just also to make the installation easier. And, and two is like a, a prerequisite for three. Um, so that will help a bit. The different GitHub repositories will stay for now. So there's we, certainly I feel there's a good reason to have them separate. We have 1,600 pull requests for easy config files versus like 200 for framework. If you're going to mix those, it's going to be a huge mess. So I'm, I don't want to. Um, they want to have that situation. I think it makes sense to have separate repositories, even though and that will come up later in the survey. People don't like this situation, and I, I, I see why. If I run into software that's spread across repositories, <coughs> I also go, oh, "What the fuck are you doing?" But then Easybuild is doing the same thing. Um, so yeah, I feel we have good reasons for that. A couple more minor things that I hope to get to. For EasyBuild 4 is getting rid, or at least deprecating, the dummy toolchain and replacing it with a system toolchain. So this is just a rename, but there's some funky behavior in the dummy toolchain that we want to get rid of. Um, and the system toolchain will not do this anymore. So it's, it's a detail, but and system makes more sense than dummy anyway as a name. A custom EasyBlock for OpenAPI because and this has come up in the in the EasyBuild conf calls. With recent versions of OpenMPI, it's very hard to have a single configuration that works for most people. So we, we need more logic to deal with that. And the only way to implement logic is to have an easy block rather than only an easy config file. So that's something. And something I've been wanting to do is we now, by default, we use setup.py install for Python packages. That's the default mechanism. You can tell EasyBuild to use pip instead. I actually want to switch that default to using pip as default and having support for setup by install. Because pip is the, is the recommended installation tool for Python packages. But I've been running into a couple of issues with pip that are very frustrating. So I'm, I'm starting to s second guess this. I'm not entirely sure anymore whether it's a good idea. Uh, I, I was looking into an issue with pip last year. They have a fancy new build isolation feature which messes things up. And you have to disable it to make it behave. So if they keep doing things like this, this may actually be a bad move. So I'm, I'm not sure about this one yet. The current idea to have EasyBuild 4.0.0 available is somewhere this year. But that's very early on. And it really depends on whether, whether we hit any roadblocks or any hard to solve problems with these requirements. But the way it's looking now, I've been making quite a bit of progress on the Python 3 compatibility already. It seems doable, but ask me again in May, and we'll see what the situation is then. So Python 3 support has already, is work in progress since, well, uh, end of last year, let's say, so about a month or uh, about a month I've been working on this. It's done in a separate branch, a 4.x branch in the <coughs> framework repository. So we're, we're, we'll keep working on EasyBuild 3, new releases, 3.9, 3.9.1 will probably happen in the coming months. So the, we're not going to stall releases for this. 
but in parallel we're working on is in a separate branch to start porting easy build to python 3 that's that's the first goal and, and we're keeping this in sync with develop of course anything that's implemented new or bug fixes in develop will merge back into the product x branch and i will take care of that i know the code base well enough that it's it's a, a little effort for me or small effort for me what's been done already so one thing that kept us from adding python 3 support for a long time is relying or is having vsc install and vsc base as dependencies because these are not ported to python 3 yet and partially because of the the decision that red hat made that they will still have python 2 and in, in rel 8 and anything based on it i have the feeling that we won't be spending enough time on porting vsc base to python 3 or we're certainly gonna it's gonna take or just one or maybe two years to actually port this and this Without having this ported, we cannot even start looking at easy build. There's no point. The, the option parser, the logging infrastructure, a couple of other things are provided by VSC base. So without that, you can just even start porting easy build itself. So that was a blocker. I got fed up with this after trying to convince the guys in our team we should start working on Python 3 support. We don't have time for it. It's not a, a critical thing yet, so it kept being postponed. So I decided, together with getting rid of the of dependencies which I mentioned here we've just copied whatever code we are using from VSC install and VSC base into the easy build framework um, merge that as a pull request and now we have control over the code and we can start porting the parts we need to Python 3 I, I dropped a whole bunch of code that is not relevant to easy build so that helps with the porting effort we don't have to look at that and VSC base will probably be ported yeah separately uh, just for our needs. So we use VSC base as a, a base for lots of our scripting stuff in, uh, in our infrastructure. But again, since it's not critical, since Python 2 will still be around for quite a while, I don't expect this to happen this year, maybe not even next year. It depends on how much time and, and manpower we, we can uh, um, use for this. So this helps. Um, Ingesting VC base into the easy build framework was step zero, sort of. Another effort that was done, we can do a, an import of all the easy build framework modules in Python 3. So that's just fixing silly syntax errors like print statements and all these things are, are now fixed. So the imports work, that doesn't mean the code works, um, but it's a first step. You can configure easy build in Python 3 now. So you can run the setup configuration function that works in Python 3 and it, it generates the right configuration as a result. Um, and we have some of the test suites already passing in Python 3 as well. So we're slowly working towards um, having easy build compatible with Python 3. Now th this is done in small steps to keep the pull request small so others can easily review them and not have a pull request that touches 10,000 lines of code. We don't want that. We want to keep them short and focused so people can look at it for half an hour and say, okay, test pass, uh, changes look okay, we merge this and we move on to the next um, set of test modules. Uh, in the coming months, I hope to find enough time to keep working on this. So the first step is definitely making all the tests pass in framework, suite by suite. I think we have about 10 sub-suites of tests, so just work on them one by one but in a particular order because file tools was like the first one because everything else uses file tools so it has a certain order there and hopefully keep the pull requests rather small so they are easy to review by by the maintainers once framework is done we should take a look at easy blocks now i don't think any big porting effort will be needed for easy blocks it will mostly be changing changing import statements because we we ingested vsc base so we shouldn't import from vsc base anymore but from another location in the easy build framework. That will be the biggest change and which is very trivial to make. Um, for easy config files, I don't think we have to change anything. So the, the syntax we're using in easy config files is Python syntax, but it still works in Python 3. So that should be okay, I think. I haven't tried it, but um, I don't expect any big problems there. Once all of these three are done, it's all just testing, actually doing builds on top of Python 3, see if we hit any weird things. And then when we're happy with that, we can do an easy build 4.0 release with support for Python 3. Maybe we'll mark it as experimental just to tell people, like, be careful if you do this in production because it hasn't been fully tested by lots of people yet. But I guess it depends on how smooth this process goes. 
People who want to help out are definitely welcome to help out. So we have a separate label and framework for these pull requests. I know Victor, for example, has already offered help to um, to help out with the Python 3 support. So if others are willing or can spend some time on this, it's certainly welcome. Okay, then a bit, oh, maybe any questions on this? Now is a good time to. Oh, people are happy with how we're. Yeah. I just have one question concerning the PPU's age for easy build four. Yeah. So setup actually compiles the code, right? So you get better performance from NumPy, for instance. Like, and for pip, you won't have it. So how is going to do that? Pip doesn't compile. No, I think it just downloads the 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 compile. The wheel? Yeah. No, not not the way easy build does it. Easy okay. easy build downloads the source package. And does pip install dot in the impact directory, so okay. it will also compile from source. Okay, okay. We are not pulling in wheels. We're okay, we're okay. staying away from that yeah, okay. for for exactly that reason. Yeah. yeah. More questions? Ah, no. Okay. <laughs> I was expecting another <laughs> question. <laughs> All right, um, a bit of a jump to the common tool chains or the community tool chains. Maybe we should rename them a bit. Um, so these were introduced several years ago. So two, let's say, standard tool chains that we try to recommend people to use um, to focus the efforts a bit. So we can more easily reuse each other's work. So we have an Intel-based tool chain, Intel compilers, Intel MPI, Intel MKL, and then a free and open source software tool chain, which is GCC, OpenMPI, OpenBlast, Scala Pack, and F50W. We, we kept the name generic here to allow exchanging one of the components for something else. Like at some point, OpenBlast development was really slowing down, or there were no releases anymore for like a year or a year and a half. And we were starting to consider switching to a different Blast Laypack level. In the end, we didn't need to because it, they, they picked up again in doing releases. But having a name like this allows us to just change something under the covers and Hopefully you don't notice. Um, it helps a lot to focus the effort. If people use these tool chains, they can more easily use each other's easy config files. That, that has certainly helped. The latest version, ah, this is a typo, this should be A. Um, the latest version of the tool chains was included in Easy Build 381, which was released yesterday, so it's very new. Um, based on GCC 8.2, latest bin utils. Not the latest OpenMPI because that's a 4.0.0 which has some changes in API and things like that. So, and people ran into trouble there. So we're sticking with the latest OpenMPI 3, uh, latest OpenBlast, latest F50W, and for Intel 2019A, uh, latest <coughs> compilers, latest MKL. For MPI, we're using the latest 2018 version because there there were issues with the latest 2019 version on bigger scale. If you run big jobs, then things just go wrong very badly. Like, if you have jobs of, what was it, thousands of cores, Damien? When, when, when did the issue pop up with 500. even 500 yeah. cores? Yeah, things just fell over. Before, before you get, uh, 1500, yeah, so about 1,000 or even 500 cores, you already see the problem. And Intel support has reproduced the issue. And we just decided, OK, we're going to stay away from this, this version for now until they fix the problem. So maybe in 2019b we can go back to using the latest version for all these components. So when, when we when we define these tool chains, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, this is a typo, yeah. Yeah, I know, sorry. It's David's fault, he reviewed the slides, he didn't see. Um, so we also asked in the survey which Tool chains people are using, so full tool chains, not sub tool chains like GCC core and things like this. So to, to try and make some sense of the results, and it's it's pretty clear the common tool chains jump out as the most commonly used ones. That's very good. There's even a shift to using the latest um, common tool chain, so 2018B, which is pretty much the latest that was available at the time of the survey, is used by most people. So 60% use the latest FOSS. 
and like 45% use the latest Intel, so that's very good. Some people still use an older version, which is which is also okay, it's still a common toolchain, um, so they can still reuse each other's efforts. And then a whole bunch of people, a smaller amount of people, are, are using other ones. So there's two versions of FOSS and Intel that just add CUDA into the mix as well. So some people with GPU systems are ob obviously using these. <coughs> More people are using FOSS CUDA than Intel CUDA. There's, is there a good reason for that? Okay. That you don't combine Intel with CUDA? Probably because they haven't produced these conflicts for holding yeah. CUDA. Okay. I'm not sure if there's a, a, an issue there with latest Intel version. Not quite sure. Yeah, there is. They're not that per not supported by NVIDIA. Yeah, yeah. So that may be why. Yeah, that may be why people are not easily combining Intel with CUDA. Some people use a mix of FOSS and Intel, which is IO MKL. This is Intel compilers, OpenMPI, and MKL or GI MKL, so GCC, Intel MPI, and MKL. So we have like a mix of everything, but that's certainly less than the more common toolchain. Yeah, close to 20% of the people who replace Intel MPI with Open MPI, that may be related to problems that people have been seeing in the past with Intel MPI, or it may be because of licensing. So Intel MPI is not free or was not free for a long time. It, it you get better performance with Open API than Intel MPI. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, depends on the code. <coughs> yeah, it's just yeah, it's good to know what people are using, and the, the common toolchain effort seems to be picked up quite well. So that's good. How frequently should they be updated? So now we do twice a year: once in January, once in June, July. We try to. Sometimes we shift it a bit because we, we know there's a big or an important release coming of one of the components. So I think 2018A was delayed a bit because of a big important OpenMPI release that kept being stalled. Hopefully we won't make that mistake again or we won't have to do that again, but we usually try January, July. And that seems to work well for most people. Some people say once a year is enough. I'm not sure it is. Um, because that also we, we also lock dependency versions per toolchain. So if we're sticking to Python, let's say three three six six, that's the Python we will use for that toolchain. And if we do it once a year, we're stuck to that version for a whole year. That may be too long. Um, some people don't care. Some people say more frequently. Then um, if they start helping out, then maybe. But. Uh, How many software installations were people doing? So some people use it for just a handful. Maybe they're just getting started with Easy Build. Um, more than half, or yeah, more than half of people use it for more than 100 installations per year. We are, or our team is certainly in the, in the thousand mark here. So um, also because we use Easy Build for pretty much every every install we do, which is this question here. And this is a bit small. I apologize, but. So the green is, is basically good. Uh, here here were people saying, yes, we install, we use EasyBuild for everything. This is, has, has some exceptions. The yellow says it's the main way. So the vast majority um, uses EasyBuild for most of their installations. And then here, the people still install manually. The green is mostly no. And then the, uh, the blue is yes sometimes. So maybe. People are very familiar with a particular software package or they want to be in full control over how it's installed. And they don't like how EasyBuild is doing it or they don't know how EasyBuild is doing it, so they, they want to be in control. I guess that makes sense. This is very similar to what we saw last year, so there's no shift in one way or the other. Easy config files that people use. 85% um, uses the ones we include in EasyBuild. So again, the efforts we make are certainly appreciated there. Many people use their or create their own easy config files, probably mostly for, for simple updates. About half of the people have their own repository where they keep things nicely organized, hopefully. I hope a lot of these are also coming back and through the central repository so they benefit everyone. And there's actually things we can do there in EasyBuild to make it easier to pick up easy config files from somewhere else. Um, that's probably also a feature we should we should work on. Um, custom easy blocks, half of the people have at least some, 
customized easy block. Some people have over five, which I consider a lot. Um, so hopefully there also they're they're being contributed back. I guess you're one of the people that has more than five. More than fifteen, yeah. But you're uh, yeah. But you're actively trying to get those changes back. So so I hope that the people that have these customized easy blocks try to make the effort of putting them back into mainstream. Side so specific customization, so this is a bit across the board. Twenty percent or eighteen percent have no customizations at all. They just use easy build like the way it is. The biggest part uses custom easy configs, probably small updates or things that are easy to do. And then a bit less than half actually customize code either in easy blocks or both in easy blocks and framework. Um, so again, here pr probably people have good reasons. They're trying to fix problems they are seeing in their easy build installation first and then hopefully also contribute it back. But it's hard to, uh, to get a good view on that, I guess, whether people are doing that consistently and it's certainly a time issue I know for, for okay it's mostly a matter of time whether to contribute things back or not uh, it's not a matter of, uh, of not wanting to or not being able to then looking at the mailing list so it's still growing over 250 people on the mailing list which is quite good uh, the line keeps going up which still scares me a bit but okay um, traffic has actually gone down last year compared to 2017 that I don't think that's a bad sign I think it's because of slack a lot of people have jumped into the slack channel and just ask questions there and usually get an answer more quickly than on the mailing list because it's easier to just quickly give an answer than, than type out the whole mail and try to be friendly in the email slack is a bit more informal I guess that's where the effect comes from and it's probably a, a good thing as long as people get answers to their questions this is an overview of the Slack channel. Now Slack is a commercial tool, so it doesn't allow you to see the growth of people joining the channel unless you pay for it. Like, yeah, I'm not going to do that just to get a graph. doesn't make sense. But they did give me this graph. So very recently, we, we passed 50,000 messages sent on the Slack channel, and it has only been here for about a year and a half. And it's like steadily growing in the amount of people that are active. So the green line is weekly active. The blue line is weekly active and posting messages. So green is only reading, blue is also actively posting. So that, that's good. Um, so this is certainly a good place to um, ask questions and get help. The nice thing is if you're really not a big fan of Slack, that's fine. You can join the IRC channel and we have a bot that sends any message on Slack to IRC and the other way around. So if you don't want to use the commercial Slack tool, it's perfectly fine <coughs> and you can still talk to people who are on Slack just have a bot that in between sends things back and forth and the bot has been very stable has been working quite well so it's running on a VM somewhere that Pablo manages and he has to look at it like once a year or so so it's very good uh, and if people want to join the slack channel you need an invitation but there's this app running here that you can enter your email address and it will send you an invitation so you can join it's a big a bit backwards but yeah if Slack doesn't want to have open an open channel that anyone can join, then you just work around it like this. Now, what's important here, and we saw the same thing last year in the survey, is um, let's say this number is wrong. Oh no, this is the green one. So some people are on the mailing list but not reading the posts. So yeah. Just filtering it out and then dev null, I guess. Almost 40% are only reading posts, so never typing a mail themselves or answering any questions. Most people only only participate occasionally, and some people yeah, are not joining or are not interested. And in Slack, it's even worse. So, like 60% of the people are not in the Slack channel, which is fine. You don't have to be if you don't want to. Um, Another like 20% barely pays attention to it and only about 25% actually at least reads the post or joins the discussions. Um, that's important to know because it means if we're discussing something on Slack channel, we're, it's a very small group that makes decisions. So we should try not to do that. At least push it out to the mailing list where we reach more people, but definitely have some official record of it, like open an issue in one of the repositories 
and try to have the relevant discussion there and please document why we made some decisions. Um, and this is not even covering the conf calls. So the, the bi-weekly conf calls we do get on a good day 10, maybe 12 people joining. So that's even a smaller group of people. Um, at least the conf calls are very well, well documented. So I'm taking detailed notes on them. So that's good. But it's good to take this into account. If we ask a question on Slack, we, we should never expect to get a relevant answer from the community. Uh, that's just good to know. And the easy build documentation has been well, slowly growing. We get 400, 500 weekly visitors. That's unique visitors, not visits, but visitors. That's quite good. Now, what they are doing, who knows? That's just Google telling us somebody was hitting this page. Are they actually reading stuff? Maybe they're looking for something else that's called easy build. I don't know. Uh, this is very hard to, to view, but it, it will be clear on the slides if you're watching the slides. This is a map of the world that shows where the visits are coming from. This is Europe, obviously. Quite a lot in North America. Here in the middle, nobody lives, or I don't know what happens there, but Central America doesn't seem to have a lot of data centers. <coughs> or everybody uses Slack, uh, yes, uh, SPAC here, sorry. I don't know, Australia, a bit in Asia, so it's, yeah. This, the sun never sets on easy builds, so and that's quite cool. And this is still the best way of figuring out how many people are using easy builds. You just look at how many people hit the documentation, and you assume that they are using easy build and trying to figure out something on how to how to do a certain thing. I don't know of any better way of counting users than <coughs> this. Questions in the survey related to the documentation: How complete is it? So. Quite a lot of people seem happy, fairly complete, or like three quarters of the people. Most of the others are saying, okay, I'm probably in the 1% that considers it incomplete. So I know a lot of gaps in the documentation that we should really cover. And this is coming up at the end of the survey as well. So the problem is the documentation is very unsexy to work on. You rather do code and write text that explains how the code works. Um, it's all known, but yeah, hopefully we can change this. So if anyone really likes writing documentation, let me know. I'll tell you what to put in the documentation. Uh, how often do people consult it? Uh, at, f at least three quarters consult it once a month. So at least people are, are using the information that is there. That's good. And how useful is it? At yeah, the vast majority says at least somewhat useful. So it, it's certainly useful to fill the gaps that we have in the documentation, even though people are mostly satisfied with what we have already. So favorite easy build feature. The answers here are a bit different from last year because we gave different options or we gave more options. Most people seem to like the what we call dependency resolution. Massimiliano is going to disagree with me a lot on that. And it's, it's, uh, it's certainly understandable. The robot just picks up what is missing, installs it, and you can get a whole stack like this. But what what uh, what SPAC has is certainly a lot more advanced than what EasyBuild has there. Try toolchain and try software version is basically generating a different, slightly different easy config file, so you don't have to do it manually. So quite a lot of people are, are think this is the favorite feature in EasyBuild. The GitHub integration, I'm in this box here. This, this is what allows you to easily contribute stuff to EasyBuild, and I will discuss this this afternoon how that works. Uh, extended dry run this if you use eb-x it will show you what easy build is planning to do without actually doing it so you get like a, a report all the commands it will, uh, will run in a couple of seconds and it won't change anything on the file system so it makes a couple of guesses here and there and it tries to give you a, a report it's not going to be 100 percent accurate but it's going to be very very close to what it actually does that's quite useful and dash dash trace i like this one a lot as well just gives you more information about what's going on Rather than just saying building, it will say, I'm running this command. It started at this time. It's running in this directory. And you can see the output it's generating in this temporary log file. So you can tail it and just see what is going on. Rather than just saying building and uh, going for a coffee and I have no idea what's going on. So it, it gives a bit more, um, a better idea of what EasyBuild is doing. We do? Ah, oh, perfect. I knew it was a good idea to, to <laughs> mention that. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So which parts of Easy Build do you not like? So people could get multiple answers here. A bit of a, a naughty question maybe, but it, it's good to, to know. And this is no surprise, the fixed versions we have for dependencies, that's the biggest thing people don't like. Which is exactly the opposite what SPAC does. So I see Massimiliano smiling. So he will explain on Friday what SPAC does here. It's very different from what Easy Build does. And we should yeah, try to loosen that up a bit, what we currently do. I still think it's a, a risk is not a, a good way of uh, is not a good word for it, but it, it will open up surprises once we start making this more flexible. If you say I don't care which CMake version is used, just use whatever is there, then for some people it's going to work, for others it's not. So it has a it's a double-edged sword. Um, some people have no features that they don't like. That's very good. Lack of manpower, I'm, I'm in this box, so we get a lot of contributions, it's hard to keep up. Uh, if we had some or more dedicated manpower, we can certainly do a lot better than what we're doing now, even though we're doing okay, I think. Um, which is one of the reasons that we're looking into European funding, to score some funding, to have some dedicated manpower for easy build, which is not there yet. And then a whole bunch of other things, a long tail, I guess. The other includes things like lacking documentation. Has, at least I certainly agree with that. No support for uninstalling packages. <coughs> this pops up a lot. I think there's even a pull request open for it that sort of works, but is, is not complete. I think Miguel looked into this. And yeah, we should just get it in there with a big fat warning around it. Like if you do an uninstallation, you may be breaking something that EasyBuild doesn't see currently. So there may be things floating around that rely on the module that you're removing. But if they're not in the view of easy build, if they're not in module path or not in the easy build prefix, then you may be breaking installations in other places. And it's just impossible for easy build to know. As long as you print a big fat warning and people agree, then it's, it's up to them to break other stuff. Like if you have central installations and you remove it, people may be building their own modules on top of the central installations and you will break their stuff. And it's pretty much impossible to know that upfront. So be very careful to do that. I guess it's just a matter of warning. Lack of support for Python 3 came up as well, but we're actively working on that already, so that's good. And other tools and projects that people use in combination with EasyBuild. Elmod, no surprise. I'm sorry, Xavier, but <laughs> Elmod is certainly the biggest uh, or the most commonly used modules tools. <coughs> modules tool, the latest version or the old 6 version. I think tmod is here, that's your 4.x version. At least some people are using it, so that's very good, but more people are apparently stuck to the old one. Now, I'm not sure how correct these answers are, because it was clear in the list of answers what is what, but how certain, certain people are, which version they are using, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if everybody ran module-version before giving the answer. Maybe they were just guessing but to get rid of the survey, I don't know. So don't rely on this too much. but it gives, I guess the main, main conclusion with respect to modules tools is that LMOT is more popular than any. Uh, okay, yeah, that's that could be an option to add an, a question of, of which modules tools do you use and why and, and why or why. Or yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I guess if they are really using 3.2.10, Probably because it works and they don't want to touch it. I mean, I know, and you will talk about this, Tmod 4 has newer features, and so does LMOD compared to this really, really old version right now. But if people don't know about the features or they don't think they need them, then it works and they don't touch it. That's probably a big part of it. Lots of people use Slurm. Now, I'm not fully sure whether they actually use Slurm in combination with EasyBuild, so if they use the, the distributed installation feature. So you can, if you use dash dash job, you can tell EasyBuild, just spread the installation for each dependency as jobs to the cluster. And any uh, installation that can be done together at the same time will be done as long as the job starts. And EasyBuild makes sure that things are done in the right order. So that, that's very useful. Like if you're populating a new cluster, to buy a new cluster, you have to install the same thousand modules that you have on the old cluster. You can basically do this overnight with EasyBuild. You just send it to the cluster as jobs and the next morning, Hopefully, most of them are done. And this is also how I how I do the regression testing of EasyBuild. We have 
in the latest test, because I skipped the oldest tool chains that, that are deprecated, there were close to 8,000 jobs being submitted to the cluster. And I was lucky, over the weekend, there were like 10 or 20 nodes free and just ran through the whole thing over the weekend. So that's very useful. And yeah, certainly a lot better than having a single box doing all these builds. Yeah. Can ju just one thing about the, the, the minus minus job. Apart from the GCG Pi, which is all, all configurable, the other methods are not really configurable. So the Slurm support at the moment like doesn't take any options, right? There's no way of putting some options right. in there. And, and that's like for easy. our system that's essential, right? There's no yeah. way you can run something yeah. without without doing that. It it does it gives you a couple of options like you yeah, but you c th there's some that you can't put. There's some things that don't go into environment variables, right? And and also there's no documentation that you can do that, right? That some people might not know that all it's these not variables. Not mentioned in the documentation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, you would just want an option to say just pass this to S batch. Yeah, just just That's take this take this option and put it in as a string. It's very right? simple to add. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy. Yeah, yeah the, the Slurm support now is pretty basic. That's true. Yeah. Uh, lots of people are. At least using singularity, maybe in combination with easy build. So that's not fully clear here. I don't know if Eduardo already made it here. No, still jet lag, but he will show up. Um, so that's quite good, and it, it's growing as well compared <coughs> to what people were, were mentioning last year. I don't like this one. 16% also uses Conda. I hope you really know what you're doing if you're using Conda, because it's First of all, it may give you installations that are not optimal for the hardware you're running it on. That's one part. And once you're using Conda, you basically have to do the whole stack in Conda. If you try to use Conda together with modules, things get hairy. Um, so hopefully people know what they are doing when also using Conda or using Conda for certain things. I'm not saying you really shouldn't, but at least be aware of, of the issues there. Um, commercial support, we asked this question last time as well, just to see if there's a market for commercial support. We we're not really considering adding it right now. And yeah, 4% says definitely, yeah, until they have to pay for it, maybe 20% or 21% would at least consider it, and then the others say, yeah, no. So I don't know if there's a market for it. Th there are some consultants, and there's, there's certainly one guy in the room. Where's the global person? Yeah, there. There's some consultants that do help out companies with using Easy Build for their installations. So I guess that's some form of commercial support. And there's others as well. I know Pablo has done work like this. One of the maintainers has done work like this. Fotis has done work like this. So you can certainly get help, uh, just not from the, not from HPC or Gantt at least. I'm using a custom module naming scheme. So Maybe this is not well known enough, and part of the reason is this is not covered in the documentation, which has been annoying me for a while, but not enough that I actually fixed it. Um, you can get full control over how EasyBuild names the modules it generates. So by default, it will do software name slash version dash toolchain dash version suffix, if there is one. But it's very easy to change. You write a small Python script that takes all the information, name, version, version suffix, toolchain, even other stuff. And you can just puzzle together your own naming scheme the way you want it. Um, EasyBuild comes with a, a couple of naming schemes out of the box, which you can check and you can specify which one you want to use. Or you can write your own that is derived from one of the existing ones or an entirely new one. Um, if you want to obfuscate everything or I don't know what you want to do, you can. Um, and you can easily tell EasyBuild about this new scheme you're, you're writing. And there's a, yeah, this detailed option that may be relevant to you as well. Now, this also was covered in the survey. Um, the vast majority of people is using just the default, maybe because they don't know. There's actually an option of taking control over what EasyBuild does. Maybe they are just happy. Now, the, the default scheme does generate quite long module names sometimes, so which can get confusing for users. And it's just uh, it's a flat scheme, so everything is together. You do module avail, you see everything all the time. Um, which certainly for users can be can be misleading. This is a small customized version of basically this, maybe lowercase or something like that. And then there's a minority of people, about 18%, that use a hierarchical naming scheme where things are organized in a different way. And 
I guess some people are not familiar with how that works, so <coughs> let me briefly explain that here. This is one of the, let's say, big early features that we implemented in EasyBuild is support for having a hierarchical scheme because it's not trivial to do this by hand. You really have to know how this works. And to convince EasyBuild to do it in the correct way was not easy. We had to work with Robert McClay from LMOD to really get this right. Like LMOD was built especially for hierarchical module naming schemes. I mean, there was a lot of back and forth figuring out the details, like what do you do in this situation and this combination <laughs> of things. It was not that easy to do. So in, in a flat naming scheme, like the, the default does, everything is available all the time and you get these long, sometimes nasty looking module names. If you do module avail, you see all the blue ones. And then you just pick whatever you have to load, you do module load, and then that one becomes green. In a hierarchical naming scheme, things are organized differently. So initially when you do, so the modules are organized in like a, in a tree, sort of. When you do module avail initially, you only see a very limited handful of modules, typically only compiler modules. Um, and you can have, you have multiple levels in the hierarchy, which is flexible. You can have as many levels if you want to, but usually the typical ones are the core modules, so the ones you see at the start, the modules that are dependent on the compiler, and then the lower layer is the modules that are dependent on an MPI library. Um, and through LMOD, even though module avail only shows these, it has a separate command, module spider, where you can just look through the whole tree if you, if you have to. So how does this work? You, you pick one of the compiler modules, you load it, so it becomes green here, and if you then run module avail, you see new modules popping up. So these two OpenMPI versions were built with this version of GCC. And then you can load one of those, and you get modules that depend on this GCC and this OpenMPI. <coughs> now the nice thing is here, you get shorter module names, because you don't have to have this toolchain crap in there anymore. It's like implicit in the way you reach the module. And everything that's not compatible with the compiler and the OpenMPI you've loaded is not available. You cannot load them straight away. You can see them through module spider, but not in module avail, so people get a cleaner view and they only see things that are compatible with each other, sort of. And then it has fancy features, like if you would do a module load of this one, which you can load at this time, LMOD will actually unload all of whatever you have loaded and then load them in the right tree again, so it will swap things in an intelligent way, which is, is not trivial to implement at all. And you can just tell EasyBuild to generate the modules in this way. You just change the module naming scheme and EasyBuild knows what to do. It knows what is a compiler, what is dependent on a compiler, where it goes in the, in the hierarchy. It knows to use the short module names, and there's lots of magic underneath that you don't need to care about. One downside here of this, which is the reason certainly we are not using it in Ghent, is that you have to tell your users what a compiler is and what an MPI library is. It sounds silly, but for bioinformaticians, it's like, uh, why do I have to pick a GCC thing? I don't know what GCC is, and why do I have to care? Give me access to my BLAST or whatever software. So sometimes, it, to me, it feels a bit backwards. You would actually have to turn it upside down, see the software first. If they pick a software, then you somehow magically also load whatever is needed. Maybe that's uh, something that can be implemented as well, but uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, Robert has told me it's not possible to turn it upside down. I I'm not convinced it is, but I yeah, haven't tried it myself. I know what he said, so rather than pass the mic over and say... Yeah. He was saying that uh, you can always have a default set loaded, right? So yeah. you can have a, always yeah. have a default view that does include an awful lot of software. Um, and somebody else asked a question here as well. C can the hierarchical scheme and a default be used at the same time? Um, I can answer this. Uh, it's currently not really supported, but it would be trivial. It would be fairly trivial to do. So, so the way software is installed, it's installed in a generic way, basically using the 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 easy build naming scheme for the for the software installation yeah it's um, a, it's and that's unique use, it's important to use yeah. this option though the fixed install their naming scheme yeah when you're exactly installing multiple things you have to use this one yeah and this by doing by using the fixed installer then having different trees for different formats is completely possible yeah it's possible if you so you install with naming what naming scheme first together yeah. with this option enabled and then you do another one with module only, right? That's yeah. possible. Now the, the 
the detail yeah, there is module only there. is not perfect. Yeah. So we can actually do a better job we and just let EasyBuild here take multiple yeah. schemes at once, that and then it will always get yeah, it right. In ter yeah, in terms of something we could develop in the future, that could be something that we yes. could handle, right? And so we could handle... It, it also popped up in one of the suggested features, yeah. so, yeah. If you do something like this, the robot will get more tricky. Um, maybe, because you may be in a situation where things are available in one naming scheme and not in another. Yeah, things could get hairy. That's true. <coughs> which, is, which may be why this hasn't been implemented yet. But yeah. Um, but yeah, but you, you can make EasyBuild opt out and just check if it's available, available for everything first. If not, like the combination robot may be tricky, that's true, yeah. Depends on how you do it. But as a first pass, you could say, I'm gonna assume that if it's available in one naming scheme, it's also in the other, which is in general, as long as you use this consistently, it should be the case. Yeah, and then you can see how bad it is in, in practice, yeah. You can do things step by step. Yeah, things can get hairy as soon as you, yeah. I've been caught a lot saying that this shouldn't be hard to implement, and then when you start looking at it, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It wouldn't be the first time. No. But yeah, it's in, it's on our, let's say it's on our radar to look into this. Yeah. Davide also mentioned to me that people at Supercomputing were asking about this specific thing, like being able to install the different naming schemes in one go and not afterwards because it's sort of manual work and you have to keep an eye on things and yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so I hope this is a bit clear. So EasyBuild supports this quite easily, at least in this form. Core compiler MPI and if you want to you can try to turn it upside down or have an extra level, maybe for Python. So pick a Python version and only then you see the Python packages. Actually, we have a better way of doing that. Another aspect of, of the modules that are installed is how long are they available to the users. A lot, most people said forever, which, well, which means as long as the system is there, the installations will be there and people can load the modules. This is also what we are doing now, but I'm not happy with this. On our oldest system, I would have to count, but we probably have like 3,000 modules installed. So people do avail and start scrolling and blah. They get scared. Um, I like this option better. So you, you make them available for a limited, or actually the green one. You <laughs> could make them available for a limited time and then hard remove them. Or you could make them only available indirectly. So if people know that they are there, they can still use them. But you like n stop recommending or stop making it visible to people. So you can hide the module. Or what they do in Ulig is they have like this build sets where people have to have to act act have to actively swap to an older build set to still be able to load those modules. So there's things you can do there, and we should probably also document like the different approaches you can you can do here. Um, and I just have <coughs> to find time to start hiding. Like one one very easy thing you can do with Elmod is hide things with old toolchains, hide modules that were installed with old toolchains. Um, that would be quite easy to do. Yeah, just have to find time to look into it. Okay, um, then take a look at contributors. So, both in the survey and in the, uh, well, I collected some statistics on contributors as well. And this guy is very enthusiastic. I like it. Um, so, one of the questions in the survey was how do you actively contribute to EasyBuild? Multiple answers were possible. Um, over half of the people say they open issues, so they ask for features or they report bugs. It's one way of contributing. It's a very easy way, of course. Just ask for stuff and let other people fix it. But um, it's certainly better than not reporting bugs. Like if you're not telling us that something is wrong, we don't even know that we should fix it. So uh, we certainly appreciate people doing this as well. 20% uh, is active on the mailing list. Less so is active on Slack. Um, these are pull requests. So about 40% of the people open pull requests for easy config files, that's quite good. That's close to half of the community or half of the people that answered the survey um, are at least willing to contribute back through 
through pull request and there's a good reason why this is a lot bigger than the other ones i'll get back to that this afternoon also easy blocks and framework at least there's a there's a will now contributing back here is is hard you need to know a bit of python maybe even need to know a bit of how things fit together in easy build so you need to like work yourself into easy build first and you need to know git you need to know github a bit you need to know how we test things so it's certainly harder here to contribute but at least we're getting contributions um now the, the one thing i didn't like here but i don't know if it really is it if you should make any big conclusions from it is that we're seeing a decline in in uh, the amount of people that answer these questions so are people less willing to contribute or do we just have people that are happy with how easy it works and they feel they don't need to contribute i'm not sure um now i'm certainly not complaining we get a lot of contributions so sorry how many survey answers did we get uh, last year we got 77 this year we got 93 that may be related to this, yeah. So again, it's very hard to draw major conclusions from this. It's different things could be happening. Are people actually less contributing or that we get more people answering the survey that are not contributing? Yeah, it's hard to tell, but I was just yeah, making observations. So looking at actual contributions we get, so this, is, this is number of pull requests. I should have added an axis here. Um, number of pull requests since basically since we've opened or since we've released easybuild 1.0 so this is uh the number of pull requests per year the blue bar is me so i've been mostly most active in framework since it was thrown into my lap the red bar is other people in the hpc again team so they have disappeared from framework uh, mostly due to a lack of time also due to wart one of the maintainers moving team so he moved to the vub so he's not in the red bar anymore, but he's still contributing. He's now in the in the yellow bar, well, in the green bar actually. And you can see it going down in the last two years. That's because of a lack of time of me. So it's mostly the blue one going down, not the others. The others are actually increasing, so that's that's good. So there's less less pull requests, less features, less activity and framework. Um, maybe we're also getting to a point where most of what we need is already there, and it's just details. It may be that as well. Um, easy blocks is a little bit different so you get roughly the same amount of PRs per year um, but it's less relying on me so we have more maintainers and other people outside of maintainers contributing back there which is very good the, it's a fairly low amount of PRs here because most of this is updates to existing easy blocks if something changed for a new version of software you need a different configure option or they moved from configure to CMake or things like this. The generic easy blocks are actually rarely <coughs> touched. Um, they seem to be working quite well and you get all the flexibility you need. So it doesn't need a lot of extra logic. That's good. And now it gets scary. This is easy configs. Uh, the last three years we've been getting over 1500 pull requests per year. That's quite a lot. Which is also why since um, summer 2017 i think i have it on another slide we have 10 people that help out with getting these things merged because it was impossible to keep doing it by myself uh, and you can see that the amount of people not in the group of maintainers is increasing which is good but it means more work for the maintainers so and i'll i will explain part of the reason why this explosion happened this afternoon as well uh, now it has been stabilizing, so we're around 1,600, 1,500 PRs per year. That's more than enough. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a well, not a problem, but it's it's a struggle to keep up with things that come in. So I guess we should be happy about that, and not not complaining. And close to half of contributions are by people that are not an easy build maintainer, so that's quite good. And this l this looks at how many unique contributors we have so how many different people have been contributing over the years so for easy config we, we've reached the 200 mark recently for easy blocks we've reached the 100 mark recently so over, over 200 of different people have contributed to easy configs over the years and that's that's quite good um, and if you look at it per year 
So framework is green, EasyBlox is yellow, EasyConfigs is blue. So the number of different people contributing back EasyConfigs has been steadily increasing. And it looks like this year, if it keeps going up, we'll have over 100 different people making pull requests for EasyConfigs into the central repository. So that's, that's quite good. It also means you have to talk to a lot of different people, expect them to respond to your feedback on their pull requests. So it's about a, a 1 to 10 ratio of maintainers to contributors for easy conflicts, which is challenging. Now we also have maintainers, thankfully, so a different group of people uh, dancing along. Um, so since the summer of 2017, I started actively asking help to the most active people in the community, like are you willing to spend some of your time looking into contributions because I'm it's impossible for me to to keep up I was noticing that other well real work sort of um, was becoming more and more demanding and it was hard for me to keep up by myself so now we have 10 maintainers 10 very active people in the community who are willing to spend some of their time looking into contributions and since May last year we have a maintainer of the week so one of the nine maintainers, so it doesn't include me, um, says, okay, this week I'm going to try and spend a bit more time looking into contributions, try to do one hour per day, looking at what's coming in, answering questions, testing pull requests, reviewing pull requests, and so on. Just to make it clear that there's always somebody who's actively looking into what's coming in. That's sort of the goal. So that we don't have any silent periods or things don't pile up if people um, are a bit busy. And we just plan this maintainer of the week actually have to still do it for next week or next month I think people in green are here so Alan Damien myself and okay are attending the meeting here people in red will be attending FOSDEM as well so you can run run into them there so definitely maybe give them a, a thank you for spending some of their time helping out with keeping easy build uh, active and maintained and then this is one of the last questions overall quality of easy build Excellent, great, or okay. So 100% at least said okay. There were two other answers. Could be better or pretty bad, but nobody picked those. So that's quite good. Quite happy with this. Um, and then there was another open question with suggestions for features. The one that was mentioned several times and came up already uh, in the talk is support for uninstalling packages. So if there's one big feature we should add for 3.9, maybe uh, it could or should be this. And then with, with some kind of check on what EasyBuild sees, like is this what you're removing being used somewhere else? If not, I can remove it, or at, at least I can warn you, like this may be somewhere used that I'm not seeing, so be careful. So we probably want to have some interactive thing that makes you hit yes, like Yum does. The, are you really really sure? And yeah, if they then answer yes, it's up to them. Or we could refuse if we see it being used somewhere else. We could say, I'm not going to remove this, it's used as a dependency for something else, so either use dash dash force or remove the other thing first. But that's only if it can see them, that's not... So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of that in general, but, uh, but we could also use the reproducibility thing. So we could keep a place for uninstalled packages, like we can pull the repro reprodu reprod folder out. So that if they needed right. to put it back in place, that would be straightforward like to do. A trash bin of at least the easy conflict and the easy yeah. block that was used, so they can reinstall it if they. Yeah, so at least it's recoverable in some yeah. way, right? That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. yeah. There's an issue or PR open somewhere. Find it and put it in there. Yeah. Um, better support for filtering and hiding dependencies. So I. I Somebody mentioned to me that some people here want to talk to me about this, so please do. Um, I want to hear more about what the problem here is. Maybe we're not aware of some issues or... Uh, <coughs> somebody said containers, containers, containers. I guess this is the Singularity guy. <laughs> not sure. Somebody was asking for support for skipping the sanity check. That's already supported since Easybuild 3.7. So in the skip steps, Easy config parameter, you can now mention sanity and it will skip the sanity check. We kind of refuse to do this for a long time because we know the sanity check is there for a very good reason. But now we give you the option to skip it if you want to. It's just something we will never accept in the central repository. We will not accept easy configs that skip the sanity check. It has to be there. But it, yeah, 
it's something you can easily add once the installation is done. You can check on it manually and then say, okay, these things should be there. Put them in a tenancy check and then just do an EB module only to regenerate the module, which does the sanity check as well. Uh, several or a couple of people mentioned there's a steep learning curve to pick up on EasyBuild. This probably comes back to missing documentation. I think we have missing documentation on common workflows, like how do you get started. There is a page there, but probably needs a bit of updating, a bit of work. Um, common workflows, best practices, so these two I think are, are linked together. Yeah. Uh, just a comment on that. I, I mean, uh, I think it goes further than just documentation, right? Actually, all the bells and whistles that are there for you, there's an awful lot of them, right? So yeah. having s somebody guide you who's more familiar with all of them like because you're never going to learn them all from just they're not going to read the documentation from front to back right mm -hmm. um and so they're not going to be aware of a lot of things and it's the, the typical workflow that we see with people is that they try things and then they go oh i should have done it like this from the beginning yeah um well but they, I, I mean it's hard i think it's hard to get around that without without doing like you know like having like drop-in support or something like that like where people can actually like on my system how would you configure it, or why would you make certain choice? Why do you make certain choices in your configuration? Isn't What's the impact? That documenting best practices. And yeah, get, and getting yeah. started, which is something we don't have right now. Yeah, but it's probably mo there's more to it than that. There's to and fro, right? People want yeah. things their own way too, right? They don't want it. They don't necessarily want it the way I have it or Aka has it or something like that. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Other things that were mentioned, um, this is something that's relevant for the common tool chains. I think maybe OK mentioned this one. I have a list of version locked dependencies for this generation of easy config files, or you've certainly brought it up before. Maybe you didn't answer it in the survey. <coughs> so if we were sticking to Python 3.6.6 for the 2018b tool chains, then that should be documented or listed somewhere. If you need to pick a Python version, you know what to do. And we could probably automate this for uh, at least partially. Loosen up the restriction on dependency versions. At least one person <coughs> mentioned this. I'm suspicious that Massimiliano was answering the survey as well. No, no. <laughs> then, then it was Todd, not no, you. I, I refrained from that. <laughs> um, another one that was mentioned, semi-auto creation of easy configs based on existing ones. So that's kind of what Try Toolchain, Try Software version does. There's, this, there's an open pull request for eb-new, which doesn't do this yet, but it, it could, and it's, it's different from what Try Toolchain does. So this is one I hope to finish for 3.9. And yeah, but one thing that's definitely missing now, the implementation is a bit hairy, but it's def definitely missing documentation. So this is not one we will merge without having proper documentation for it, because nobody will know how to use it. So there's no point in adding it. So documentation first, and then merging the PR. Um, installing multiple packages in a single directory more easily. That's kind of supported already. You can define a bundle of things. Let EasyBuild install the bundle. That's how we installed X11, for example. We already have good support for installing bundles of Python packages, which all go into the same directory. M maybe what is mentioned, what is intended here, is that you have eb install this, 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 and this, and then an option like pack it all in the same install directory and give me a single module for it. Maybe that's a. The problem with bundles is if you start using easy blocks. The problem with bundles if you start. It may have changed in recent versions, if but in all the versions it checks all the parameters. And so if an easy block defined new parameters, which you used or try to use in your bundle, the, you got an error message that those parameters were not recognized. I so in those fields for a bundle, it only seems to recognize a number of standard parameters. I think that, that, that we fixed that. So I should try it again yeah, now you should in try it again. You, you mean like configure options for one specific Python package or yes, something like or that? Things yeah, like that's even fixed. Yes, or even things like built here in CMake, I think, was even refused. Yeah, but now that yeah. that's picked up, any anything you can put in a, in a normal easy config file, like configure options or build and install there, all these things you can also do for extensions. So also easy block specific ones. Yeah. 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 That's all recognized now. I'm not sure which version it was fixed in, but it's three six or three seven. Yeah. You can you can find it in the release notes, but it's something that should be dealt with now. And if it 
yeah. So if it's not, yeah, it 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 hasn't, yeah, maybe in the last six months or eight months, it's something we dealt with. Yeah, yeah. Um, better error reporting and readability, and this is a, has been a pain for a long time. I've done some work here related to the robot. So the robot should be spitting out better error messages now in the latest versions. But the build logs themselves are still big uh, and confusing if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, maybe we need some, some logic and easy build to help you to quickly <coughs> zoom into the actual error, like known patterns for errors and extract them or I don't know what. But this, I think this is not an easy one to fix. I think SPAC has some logic for this, Massimiliano, for zooming in on actual errors for installations. Back. So, um, well, so the one of the things that popped up in the survey was that we should have better error reporting or a better way of when a build fails to actually zoom into what the actual problem is, like where is the compilation error or. So what we did with uh, Spark was basically to steal um, the already awesome way that CMake has to scrape on build logs and whatever. CMake has awesome features. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that, that can be unexpected, but yeah. <laughs> and basically, we use the same uh, regular expressions to scrape logs, and we provide comments to, I don't know, look after build logs, and then just like show to the user Zoom into what, the what is exactly the errors right. that you have. And we could also search for warnings even after the fact restore i don't know the, the build output yeah. or the config log yeah we do the same thing we store it but we have no exactly. facilities and, and, to and then we have facilities to scrape it if you yeah. need okay i'll have to look into a, a cmake feature crap okay no that's good feedback yeah Wait, take, take the mic first yeah that might be also something useful for the minus minus job because I actually have no idea where the logs are written in that case because I have no idea even on which machines the logs are written. So that's also s where we can uh, well, improve. If the build succeeds the same way as yeah, but as the problem is when you need the log when the build doesn't. If succeed. not, I don't know what it does, but it probably dumps them wherever you ran the job that mm -hmm. job command. So it, it dumps them to where your build your response should be, and it can. Yeah. The problem is the temporary is mm. local work, not, not global. You have, you have to specify a, a global temp not your direction. Yeah. <laughs> and is that covered in the documentation? It may not. It's, it's covered in the temp not your documentation, but not in the job documentation. Yeah, yeah. So it, it should be a, a section yeah. there that says, how do I get logs for failing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, support for using multiple naming schemes, which has already come up, so, which seems easy at first, but after what Damien said, I'm now scared about implementing it, but we'll see. So all these things are, yeah, on, on our radar, let's say, and if anyone is interested in working on any of these, certainly help, um, it would certainly help to let us know so we can, we can kickstart you with it. <coughs> then a little bit of future work. I'm almost done talking here. I haven't kept an eye on time at all, but okay, we're doing quite well. Um, one thing that's now a bit of an ongoing discussion for the people have been, who have been following the mailing list and the conf calls in the recent weeks um, is we're looking into some ways to change how we deal with Python and Python packages. And that's even separate from running EasyBuild on top of Python 3, which is a whole different issue. Now, and there's two things we're we're looking into. Um, so right now, Python itself is being installed with a full toolchain like FOSS or Intel, um, which is a a bit stupid and weird because you have two Python installations which are basically the same thing. So the the interpreter, whether it's built with Intel compilers or GCC, it has an impact, but it's quite small and only a very specific cases it actually matters in terms of performance so the idea would be to like pull down 
the Python installation to the, the GCC core subtool chain and have one Python installation <coughs> that you can use with multiple different full tool chains. Um, how the best way of doing that, there's a bunch of options there and, and Mikael who has been working and thinking about this has opened a very good issue with the different alternatives that we're considering and what the pros and cons are of each of them. Um, you can find it somewhere in the issues. I should have linked it here, but it shouldn't be too hard to find. And then related to that, so we pull down Python to GCC core, but for some Python packages that we install with Python, like NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, who, re who requires NumPy and so on. So some of these need a an, blast an or a laypack or even an MPI, like MPI for Py. So these should be separated and be installed with a full tool chain because GCC core does not provide this. So basically you have to split the Python interpreter with some basic packages like pip and setup tools and then have a separate bundle with Python packages that need blast laypack. Uh, so the question is a bit how do we do this? Where do we use the Python name? Do we use it for the interpreter or for the bundle? And if not, how do we name the bundle? And how do are there ways to make it transparent to users so you don't actually notice that something changed? And I think that's some, something we can do. We can have like a wrapper that gives the same name as before, but then underneath actually load something else. So there's a whole bunch of options there. We're, we're looking into this now. And this will certainly be in the coming conf calls and coming weeks. Um, we will look into changing this maybe even already for 2019A. So the Python installations and the 2019A tool chains. It depends a bit on how quickly we can make progress on it. Um, so it has to happen in the next couple of weeks if we want to do it for 2019A. But certainly for 2019B, we will try to do this. And we'll try to do it in a way that doesn't impact people that are happy with how things are now. So you can sort of have like the, the two options and you can pick whether you want to do a hard switch or make it a transparent switch for your users. So we're not fully... Uh, sure about this yet but keep an eye on the mailing list keep an eye on the notes for the conf calls if you don't follow the conf calls and we'll try to make this a very transparent process and be very vocal about it on the mailing list ask, ask people for feedback tell people what the kind of impact was we'll probably also have a dedicated page in the documentation for it like what changed and how can you make sure it doesn't impact your users and so on doing this is gonna make the maintenance of Python packages a lot easier because having one Python module also means that for a lot of Python packages you'll also have one Python module rather than now two like uh, H5Py for example you have now two separate modules one for FOSS one for Intel which probably doesn't make sense like you can have one that you can just combine with other full tool chains so it will limit the number of easy config files and modules we have for Python packages hopefully but it's something we have to look into and actually see what kind of impact it will have and then separate from this, so both of these can be done orthogonally. We can do one and not the other, or the other way around, or both, or none. Um, we can have support in EasyBuild for installing Python packages, a particular Python package in a single install directory, but for multiple different Python versions at a time. So we could install, let's say, NumPy, to or let's say, Mapplotlib, which is already a separate easy config. We have one Mapplotlib. 2.x installation that is compatible with both Python 3 and Python 2. So you have one module, you do module load matplotlib, and depending on which Python you load, it will pick up the right part of the install directory. This is exactly what they're doing at Compute Canada, and this will be, Bart will explain how they do this in his remote talk tomorrow afternoon. So this again, this means you'll have less easy config files for matplotlib, you'll have one rather than two for two different Python versions. The module names will be shorter because you don't have to mention the Python version anymore in the module name. You just load Mapplotlib, you load whatever Python, and it works together. Um, so there's a couple of benefits from, from this as well. It simplifies things quite a lot, and they've been quite happy with it at Compute Canada. Now, they're doing more stuff in Compute Canada than only this. They also build their own wheels and let users install those wheels in their own directories, I think. So there's more going on there, but at least the, the part where they install a single package for different Python versions in one installation directory, this could be integrated into EasyBuild quite quite well. And the things that have to change are actually quite minimal, we think. But Bart is working on this himself, so uh, 
And then one other thing that certainly I would like to look into, and I've heard that other people have been looking into it or planning to look into it as well, is to, to test contributions more in isolation. So right now, a lot of the testing is being done just on our cluster. We pull in the easy config file, as we're reviewing it, we build it, and if, it's in, if it installs there, we get a successful test report, and we say, ta-da, it works. Now, in our system, we have things like Zlib, and we even have an old boost version installed on our OS, which sometimes make builds pass, even though they may not pass on other systems. So that's something, it's, a, it's an issue in the testing um, setup we have. It's mainly relevant for easy config PRs, but for other stuff as well. Now, the problem here is it's not just enough to in test contributions in a minimal environment, so something that's entirely stripped, like no Zlib, no boost, no, maybe not even an, a G++ anymore in the OS, because you load a module anyway that provides um, GCC. So we certainly need to test in this environment, but we've recently discovered you also need to test on a system that has like as much as possible, like boost, Zlib. Uh, maybe Python 2 and Python 3 installed, so that's as, as packed as possible, because some problems only pop up when you do have an old boost on the system. Apparently CMake has, by default, will look onto the system first for boost. If it finds it there, it will use that, even if you include it as a dependency in the easy config file. So that means if you don't have boost on the system, you will never see that problem, and it, the test may pass in the middle of an environment, and then if you try it on your system where you do have an old boost, it may fail. So you, you have to do the test in like both environments and maybe even things in between that have only boost and or only Zlib, so ah, it explodes. But we can certainly do a better job there, and I think Singularity can help. We can have a repository with recipes for Singularity images that we share at least with the maintainers. The maintainers build those images and use them on their test system. And it also helps. We can test for different Linux distributions, even though we are using CentOS 7. Through a Linux, uh, through a Singularity image, we can test for Debian or Ubuntu or Slash if we want to. It kind of explodes the amount of environments we may have to test things in, but we can pick, I guess, the test environments depending on how important the easy config files are. Like for tool chains, common tool chains, we would test maybe a bit <coughs> more to have more um, or to have a better idea that things work in different environments as well. While for other PRs, we may be less. Uh, testing a bit less, it depends. So that's something I would hope to find time for. I'm doing some of that already. I have an, a singularity image for CentOS 6 that I use to reproduce problems <coughs> that people report for CentOS 6. That has been helpful because it helps me to reproduce the problem and then figure out a way to fix it properly. Uh, but we should, should do that more and in a more organized way, hopefully. And then, I guess we're almost done so next year will be the fifth easy build user meeting well next year maybe this year um, i'm leaving the option open to to collocate it with supercomputing um in november that may be a good idea to fifth edition do it in the us for once rather than all the ones we've had in europe um so if people are interested and if davide sees this i think he will go haha uh, so davide is in the us and he has been uh, quite active in the community that that's maybe an option to do it or yeah I either at supercomputing so that would make it this year in November or early next year uh, we'll see so if somebody's interested let me know definitely planning to do this again somewhere that's all I have for now and I think I'm pretty much on time all right any more questions I'm sure lots of people have questions in their head, but yeah, so some has a... Uh, any updates on the plans of using uh, YAML easy configs? Ah, I was expecting that. <laughs> um, I didn't include anything in, in the talk here because nobody has been working on it for the last year, as far as I know. No? You did work on it. Did I see it? No, I didn't find it. I kept the okay. I kept the line for the All right. Yeah. So the, yeah, at least there has been l very little activity on it. I would say. So for for the people that, that are not familiar, one of the things we've been trying to do or been working on a little bit is 
the, the easy comfy files we have now are in Python syntax and are basically evaluated as Python syntax. So it's just key value definitions we executed in Python and we get a dictionary of things that we give to easy build and it goes like that. It's not a very nice way of doing it because we're running a Python script to figure out what to do. Another option is to use a proper configuration syntax like YAML or JSON or I don't know what. There has been some work on that um, to look into transitioning to this new format and how that would work. And together with that also, rather than having an easy config file per different version, different tool chain, to sort of collapse things together in a single file. And it's like, yeah, we could do these things separate. We could have a like the perfect mapping of what we have now in YAML syntax and then the what I call fat easy configs later. But yeah, the, I, I don't have time to work on it at all. Um, it would also complicate things a bit, like how do you make the transition? What things do you need to change on the easy build command line? Like if you have these fat easy configs, how do you tell easy build use this version? Because you have all these options and yeah. So, so what what first thing I did was to create something that dumps from the YAML format into the, the current format, right? Yep. So basically, that the first thing would be to to just to be able to parse that file, which the parser is already in there, right? Yeah. And um, maybe it needs to be updated a little bit. I don't know, but and and I have a pull request open for for being able to dump that out into into the an easy normal easy config format. Yeah. And then you can do your dependent. I mean, it's a a very indirect way of using it, right? Mm -hmm. So first you take it. You deconstruct it and then you use it. So, but that would be for me. That would be the first way thing you would do, and then eventually you remove this deconstructing part because you don't really need it. Right? Yeah. But that's the easy bit. Which let's say, well, the making sure it works. I think that's the easy. Bit. The the hard part is, do we want to support this as a separate format? Do we make this the new format? how do we transition from A to B because mm -hmm. making this change is going to affect a lot of people unless we have tooling around it that like tra translate existing easy config files to YAML it, yeah it's hairy so I'm a bit scared of that of that process if, if you see that some people are still stuck to easy build 2 even though the changes haven't been that big in easy build 3 but they feel they can it's too much of an effort this is going to have a big impact also we have 10,000 easy config files right now there's going to be a hundred of those that are a problem for one way or one reason or another. So it's it's a big effort. Uh, but it still makes sense to keep working on it. So if people want to work on it, definitely do. But I have very little time to spend on it myself. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, the big benefit is 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 that, like in the case of Easy Blocks, we're we're collecting knowledge, right? But in the case of easy config, things are getting 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 lost, right? Because people contribute something important to one tool chain, but not to all. Or maybe people don't pick up on it because pe people don't pick up on something important because they have to already have their own custom version, right? Yeah. And so they lose they're losing information. But, but just moving to YAML is not going to fix that. You need both YAML and the fat easy configs for that. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, it would be fat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't move, just move the ammo, right? I mean, I mean, fat to the ammo. Yeah, yeah. Questions uh, popping uh, up. There's another one on online here. Any plans on better handling of filter depths and easy blocks? Yeah, that was that was mentioned in the. Whoops, here. So I, I just need to hear from these people what they mean exactly. It's not entirely clear. Are there open issues on that or? If uh, not, open those I'm issues. guessing they're not in the room, right? So they're on the Slack yeah, channel. Yeah, yeah. So the people who are talking about this, maybe mention it in the chat what you mean exactly, and we can, we can see what the problem is and how to fix it. I mean, I guess, I guess, I guess they're talking about that you sometimes check for something that, that something exists, right? And, <coughs> and then if it's filtered, it, so it doesn't. It falls over, yeah. yeah. And that's a, it's actually a hard problem to fix. I think. I'm not sure how we can be robust against that. Uh, the checking at the moment just checks the environment variable, or does more than that? Yeah, no, it just does that. Well, then I mean, when you when you set something, when you filter, filter it, you, you define, define the define environment, the environment variable, variable and just assume it's there. Yeah. But sometimes the the this location might. in the environment variable also matters. Yeah, yeah. So how do you figure out the location for something yeah. installed in the OS? 
then you have to have a way of tell easy to tell easy build where it's installed and to configure it correctly so it picks it up yeah yeah it's, it, it's doable but yeah it, we need more details on this so either look into an issue that's open already and and spit your guts there or open a new one so we know what the exact issue is no more questions for now I guess we're pretty much on time, very happy with that. So now we have the, the lunch break, yeah, right? For the people on the stream, we'll, we'll be back at 1, so one, about one hour from now.